Can you see now? Yeah. All yeah. right. We are we are now live. Great. Great. Super. We're all very quiet. <laughs> well, as, as as we're not officially broadcasting yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's just under two minutes before we start, and uh, I, I'll you, what you in terms of the start. I'm just going to welcome everyone and announce the name of the session, and then start taking it from there. Mm. <clears throat> I hope Michael is going to be able to join. If he's not there from the start, it won't be a crisis, <coughs> but uh, yeah. I hope he will be able to join. I hope so too. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session at Horasis Visions this year on social investment for competitive green economies. I don't think it's a secret that the pandemic has now claimed 34 million confirmed cases around the world and over a million deaths, and those are only the confirmed cases. It's caused the sharpest recession in 80 years, a contraction, depending on whose figures you take, of anything between minus 4.5 and minus 5% in respect of the global economy in 2020. It's destroyed hundreds of millions of jobs and demanded fiscal stimulus on an unprecedented scale to preserve others. The insurance industry is predicting an avalanche of business insolvencies in 2021. So the challenge that our excellent panelists have this afternoon is to think about how we can invest in order to recover in a way that is consistent with our need for social equity and a green recovery and how we can do that in a manner that will nonetheless enable competitive businesses. We have four superb panelists with us this afternoon. We have Sunida Messi, who's a member of parliament in Albania and a former deputy prime minister. <clears throat> we have Meridula Ramesh, who is the founder of Sundararam Climate Institute in India. Ingrid Rodriguez, the founder and managing director of Iconic in Australia, and Senwe Tan, who's the chairman of Green World City, also in Australia. Michael Johnson, who's a member of the board of the Capital Group companies, may be able to join. He has apparently been delayed in joining now, but I hope he'll be able to join the session a little later. We're going to give each of the panelists an opportunity of giving us their take on this circumstance. And if I may, Sunida, 
I'm going to start with you to ask you very briefly, each of the panelists has three minutes in order to give us their overview, very briefly give us your take on where we are and what we need to do. Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Sean, for this um, introduction. In fact, talking about social investments, economy recovery, under pandemic situation is very difficult. And me, as a former member of a government, and actually as an MP, I see that uh, it's pretty much difficult because uh, we are dealing at the same time with the crisis and we need to rethink how to rebuild ourselves, uh, the economy, and completely the society during and after COVID-19. But immediately when, uh, and thanks to Frank uh, Jurgen, give me the, the idea to talk in this panel about social investments, automatically the idea came to me that yes, it's a job of government as a public service. Social investments has to do with people, investing in people. And the government is and should be in charge of designing policies and strategies to strengthen the people skills in order for them to participate fully into the working force. I mean, uh, participate fully in employment, therefore being active in society as well. Living and working for the entire 2020 so far under the pandemic situation, I would rather say that healthcare, quality of childcare, education, training, including vocational training, job search and rehabilitation, are the precondition of the economic, inclusive, and sustainable growth. Green economies, in fact, can create um, opportunities while encouraging sustainability and better correlation between people, economy, and environment. But investing in green requires a lot of much more investing. It's expensive, and the results you can see not simply now, which we are managing a crisis, but in a, let's say, middle uh, term or even long term uh, period. In the meantime, the need for the economic recovery is, uh, and for the increase of employment, it's now. In the same time, going green can cause probably uh, layoffs due to substituting of human labor with much more high technology, computers or machineries. Meanwhile, what we need now is to increase the labor-intensive job. Therefore, the government is facing short-term needs and the uh, crisis solution but there are much more um spaces or solutions which offer much more let's say long-term solutions we need to rebuild our economy yes but we need to do it much more efficient and much more pro environmentally we need to finance sustainable solutions and this requires uh, not simple ideas but analysis uh, think tanks which really shows even the government which is the best approach and best policies budgetary policies fiscal policies and uh, strategies governments need to resolve crisis and in, in the same time need to think and to give solution in the long term be it nationally with national objectives but even regionally when we are talking about environment i cannot see that the environment is an issue only of a state it's a minimum a regional solution and yes even bigger than one pandemia for example it's international so it's in all over the world and we are facing despite who is rich country despite who is poor despite who is living where in much more clean or near the water or near the mountain we are facing the same problem that's why we need to gather to resolve and to find solutions together definitely we can adapt this in our national situation but uh, together we need to be much more proactive to find better and sustainable solutions Thank you, Sunida. All I can say is you have echoed the, the plea of the United Nations Secretary General when he opened the Harassus Conference this morning, that need for collective action at scale uh, adapted to local circumstance uh, is exactly the way in which he put it as well. So thank you so much for that. Ingrid, if I may, I'm going to come to you now because you raised in an earlier discussion a very interesting point on the relationship between planet and health. And I'd really like you to spell that one out for us a little. 
Sure, thank you, Sean, and, and thank you for the kind introduction as well. Um, yeah, I just find it very fascinating when we actually talk about terms like green economy or climate change. Um, and I, I raise the point that we rarely integrate the conversation into the conversation um, the topic of health and emerging diseases. Um, pathogens actually exist, you know, uh, everywhere in our environment, um, and they're waiting for the right conditions to sort of attack and invade our bodies and cause disease. Um, and nothing's been more prevalent now than um, obviously um, coronavirus. Um, according to like scientific reports, more than 70% of all emerging diseases um, come from non-human animals. An astonishing 1.3 trillion US dollars is the annual treatment cost and production loss of emerging diseases. It's absolutely astonishing. And now you can actually double that due to COVID. Um, would people realise this or not? Pandemics are happening faster than we would like to acknowledge and um, we're running out of time in terms of um, ignoring this topic. Um, I feel that this is happening as a direct result of the deterioration in the environment um, and, you know, things like waste, urbanisation and industrialisation um, are to answer for this. Our planet's health is our health and any disruption to the environmental ecosystem has increasing consequences to human health. Um, I feel like we need to get back to an economy that is modelled on nature, uh, which is governed by cycles, um, and by getting um, rid of this linear economy entrapment. Um, a green secular economy provides that opportunity um, I feel it's a preventive model that supports the development of the people planet ecosystem or a healthy people planet ecosystem. I feel that the, that green circle economy sort of aims to shift how we do things um, back into harmony with nature so that growth can continue. Investing in the environment right now is critically important. Um, as it will generate longer term benefits for human health, but ultimately the economy also. Um, if we are to improve human health in our economy, I think those core cool planetary issues I mentioned before about waste, urbanisation, industrialisation must be um, addressed. However, it's not without its challenges, um, as in the true words of one of my favourite scientists, Albert Einstein. Um, he says we're not, we cannot solve the problems our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Um, so our so new solutions, um, innovative solutions require divergent thinking, um, require a, a cultural shift um, and a collection of strategies, but it's from all stakeholders as it was already raised, you know, including governments, policymakers, but also the general public. Um, in closing, I think I've taken up nearly my three minutes. Um, I believe that um, it's every person's responsibility um, to keep our planet healthy, um, to protect natural resources, and to consume with care. Thank you. Super. We'll unpack several of these issues in the discussion afterwards. But may I now turn to Maridula um, in terms of the issue that you wish to bring front and centre in this regard, in particular the issue of solid waste. Over to you, Maridu. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Sean, for setting that up, and thanks for both the speakers, because I think you've both raised points um, until now, which uh, hopefully I'll add to. Um, I want to say, what is the perspective I'm coming from? And I'm really coming from the perspective of an investor who invests in you know, social, who puts in social capital and does startups uh, fairly regularly. And I have several investments in waste. So that's the perspective and I'm coming from, and also the book I wrote, which is, you know, how do you spur this on in an economy? Um, so just to give you where I'm coming from. So here I really feel, you know, if you act locally, you actually can change globally. And the reason why I think hyper-local policymaking is so important rather than globally driven policymaking is that you'll have more support for your policy. So you don't have to spend as much political capital in driving through in a, you know, policies that your constituents won't buy in. And 
that's why I think waste is so powerful. And waste is something we don't think about. It contributes about 3% to global emissions. That's half of India's emission, uh, you know, annual emissions overall. And we hear so much hate and, you know, uh, grief about coal plants. But waste is an easy to solve problem, you know, gets in, gets new resources, etc. And this really came because I didn't come into this. I came from the textile industry, where if we didn't manage our waste, we would essentially make no money. Right. So our profit margins actually come from managing waste. And another advantage of managing waste is to your point, uh, Ingrid, it really addresses local health. Because if you don't manage your waste very well, uh, you can have horrible consequences to local health. And, you know, it since if you don't manage your own waste, it affects your own health. The um, externalities are easier to manage. The last point, which I think is an increasingly important point today, is the issue of jobs and waste, right? If you actually create waste management, if you make those investments in waste management well, you can create local jobs. Um, I see that in my investee companies. I think the back of the envelope calculations are between 600 to 700,000 jobs in India alone. You know, these are new jobs. These are these are not replacement jobs or anything. These are incremental jobs. And these are just, I feel this is, an, this is just exploding across India. And this is something that is just in our backyard. And we, this is, you know, in my book, I call it the fruit that has already fallen to the ground, right? It's easy to do. It's one of those things I think Sunida mentioned that, you know, um, calling for those investments is not easy because especially if you're looking at uh, payback in the future, it's so difficult to get the political capital to drive it through. But waste is one of those things where the payback is very immediate. So um, it's easy to do. It addresses the climate. It addresses health. It addresses water, which I'm very interested in. You know, I think it's just a no-brainer, easy way of getting the green economy going. And the wonderful thing is it gives us jobs and an economic return us. in short terms. <laughs> and it's so good. You know, I mean, if in India you have these uh, waste uh, managers, these pickers, essentially, that wander around landfills doing segregation. And it's it's just heartless. I don't think you can ask anyone to do that kind of job. I mean, it's just it's just horrific. And if you make those investments, you know, it's positive NPV, it's immediate cash flow, and you give those people a dignity and, you know, it's just ticks all the boxes. Well done. Thank you very much. And same way, you uh, have the luxury in a certain sense of being the man who brings up the rear. But uh, okay. this is no comment on your relative wealth. Uh, worth. Okay. Same way, over to you. Yeah, uh, my area is actually quite focused into um, building a sustain more sustainable cities and infrastructure. So I'll focus on that area. Essentially, what we do is we advise governments around the world on and giving them good ideas on what they can do. And we base our advice on basically what's been happening in different countries and giving examples of what has been successful. Uh, essentially, what we and we also work with the UN, for example, uh, in its steering committee for its World Urban Campaign. So what, what can you do when you're building more sustainable uh, infrastructure and cities. I mean, there's a lot you can do, obviously. And out of that, you cr actually create a lot of green jobs. Yeah? Uh, I'd like to bring a few exa few examples. Uh, the building of more sustainable infrastructure and cities uh, you know, by creating a better land use policy and creating more eco-master planning, you're creating all these green jobs in, in regards to uh, the people who are involved in building the framework. Yeah, and also helping preserve biodiversity, which is very important and which is something that's, you know, in the past hasn't been considered much uh, when, you know, they're focused on building new infrastructures and cities. Uh, sustainable land use, uh, for example, I, I, I like to give people like a sh short, simple example of what's been happening. Uh, for example, in China, in the past 100 years, uh, sorry, in the past three and a half years, they have used as much concrete as the 100 years previously in the United States, yeah? And that's only in the period of three and a half years, yeah? So there's a lot better ways of doing things than just uh, building 
for the sake of uh, creating more GDP. And this is what a lot of developing countries have, have been focused on. Um, eco buildings, what are the things you can do in build, uh, creating more uh, sustainable buildings? Uh, have, having better green building rating tools, uh, sitting in structural design efficiency, mater material sustainability, and energy efficiency. And obviously, obvious things like water efficiency and so forth, water usage efficiency. Uh, we also focus a lot about uh, focus on build, uh, what to do in regards to putting in more renewable energy, uh, optimizing overall percentage of renewable energy use across all areas, uh, minimizing obviously CO2 emissions from energy production, and maximizing energy efficiency across the whole community, and also use, utilizing of smart grid, which is happening in a few countries like China and so forth. Um, and, you know, in the UN produced a report that's also actually originally uh, researched, the research has been done by IEA, uh, International en Energy Agency. And the world can actually save 71 trillion, 71 trillion US dollars if we actually were to move to a more renewable uh, economy and towards renewable energy. Yeah. But the reason is, you know, think about it. We can save a lot of money, but why are we not doing it? Because the world is basically run by vested interests. And this is something that we, a lot of people haven't considered. Yeah, we have a lot of fossil fuel company and also uh, people who are involved in some of these industries spending a lot of money on misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, so this is something we've got to be aware of. And that's why there's so many... Uh, articles that are actually not factually based or based on data and actual facts. Clean air, obviously, that's one very sure important one. issue. Yeah. And other things too, which I'll cover on uh, a bit later on. I'm sure, as we yeah. get into the discussion. Let, let, let me come back to you, Sunita, right at the beginning, because you introduced an interesting tension into the whole of this. You talked about the need for an immediate response to the economic crisis that has been brought about by the pandemic. And you made the point that several of the investments that we need to make in the interests of environmental sustainability and securing our future produce returns in the medium to long term rather than immediate stimuli in the short term. Now, the reason I'm coming back to you is you've had the opportunity of hearing three perspectives from the other panelists uh, since you made that particular statement. And I'm just wondering if you gained any thoughts out of that that might help us bridge that tension that you were describing, because the tension's real. The question is, how do we deal with it? How do we ensure that we get the necessary investments while dealing with the challenge, that long-term payback is far more difficult to achieve. I'm thinking in particular of Meridula's argument about short-term payback out of waste management. But I'm, I don't want to shape your answer. I'm just interested in whether you gained any insights on how bridging might take place. Uh, if I want to make a difficult or this equation much more difficult, I need to mention that uh, when talking about, let's say, politician, always is the, let's say, uh, four years mandate. So we, we, which every kind of, I don't know, government needs to deliver in four years mandate. But the need for economic recovery, definitely it's much more, let's say, uh, long term. So always the politician has to make this kind, let's say, of um, trade off. Uh, three, four years of a mandate versus, uh, I don't know, 10 years solution. And this is always, let's say, um, a difficult uh, equation to, to resolve. But what I can say in this situation is that always I was um, um, proactive and I'm proactive and I always will be proactive of the idea that the government need to be much more, let's say, transparent and open first. Second, need to work closely with businesses, but not only, even with civil society and uh, with academia. I mean, uh, universities, uh, professors, think tanks can always, let's say, uh, put insights and uh, suggest and uh, develop, let's say, scientific research. 
uh, which need to deliver to the government to see where is the path going and what the government should be doing. Another discussion is how close and far is a government towards the businesses? Because every in every moment, business is uh, they are the one that are making the investments. They are the one that making the employment. So what the government should do here is first to give the uh, let's say um, first example. I mean, with budgetary policies, public investment, each government can go green in, I don't know, transportation, can go green in reconstructing the building, can go green in constructing the roads, can go green in uh, constructing uh, and making, I don't know, schools and theater gardens. And the construction is the business which is doing. So in this sense, we are giving first the example that, yes, green is sustainable and uh, green is for everybody. Because in midterm and long term, it can pay back. I mean, with uh, I don't know, for example, lowering the cost of uh, energy of energy bill, um, having kids uh, which are much more healthy because of uh, healthy and biodegradable uh, I don't know um, uh, construction materials that we are using. But government need to think and to hear the businesses. What uh, fiscal policy we need to develop in order to give incentives to the businesses. But even right. the civil society to really invest in green, to really invest in um, uh, social inclusion and uh, to really invest in sustainable solutions. Right. I know that, uh, let me put an example. In November last year, Albania moved into a tremendous and uh, we suffered with a tremendous earthquake. And a lot of uh, areas uh, in uh, our country were completely destroyed. And November, December, thinking about how to overcome the, the let's say, uh, one of the most uh, disasters in, I don't know, was, I think, the second after 70, 76, 77. Uh, immediately on February, March, in our country, the, we had the first cases of uh, COVID and then a total blackout of the economy. In the moment that we needed, because it was spring, and in the moment that we needed to start rebuilding our countries because of the earthquake. Uh, so we are facing a lot, let's say, of issues and crises. So once we are resolving one crisis, then it came to the other crisis. And for every kind of government, it's very much difficult to make decisions in this uncertainty period and in this period which is shaping and changing. That's why we need to hear each other and to work together. Absolutely right. I don't think there's anyone who's had to deal with policy issues in the last seven months uh, who wouldn't uh, I identify with every word that you've spoken about the nature of the challenges. Ridula, let me come back to you quickly uh, for a second here, because there's something very interesting and implicit in the approach that you're describing, and it relates to what Sanidis just said. You know, we, we all know the rubric of circularity, the whole concept of the circular economy, of seeking to ensure that we do not produce for the purpose of disposal, but that we produce for the purpose of use and potentially reuse. And that seems to me to be one of the ways to reduce the tension between the short term and the long term in this regard. And your waste disposal uh, description seems to me to fit that rather well. Any thoughts? Please keep it down to about two, three minutes max. We have very little time, as you know. Shoot. Fair enough. Um, I think circularity is a critical concept. I think it mimics life, right? Nothing in life is uh, linear. It's all circular. I think uh, it, it, in that sense, it's uh, innate to our life, in, to our way of living, or uh, to our life, not our way of living. And I think the important impetus for circularity is a resource constraint. And I will explain what I mean by that. I think if you don't make enough money, if you need to actually show profit and manage profit, you will be very vested in ensuring that your you are circular. Right? Because it is a profit stream that is otherwise just going to waste. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, so I think, you know, um, in terms of, since we are talking about the blend between politics and investment, and I think that's very important. I think where politics comes in is how can you make circularity a way of life? And I'll give you a very concrete example of what has happened in one of the cities in India. It's a simple thing. Bulk 
generators of waste anybody a uh, company uh, apartment block anyone who does more than 50 kilos of waste a day has to go zero waste and that is fond of a revolution of innovation right and i think it's a simple thing done at the city scale which will get you started I'm, I'm, I'm going to shift to saying very briefly, don't worry, Ingrid, we are coming back to you, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to find the line. <laughs> I'm trying to find the line through all of this, because one of the things that Sen Wei said, uh, he, you cited the example of the Chinese use of cement in the context of the vast expansion of the economy mm. taking place, and mm. compared that to the time frame within which the United States had used the same. Now, I happen to have friends who have run some of the large cement companies, so I'm not attacking cement in some sort of remarkable way. But it's clear that that is not perhaps the most efficient means of enabling circularity within the concept of living within the parameters that will enable the survival of the human species in an effective way. And the example that Ridul has just given of uh, incentivizing the elimination of waste by requiring those who are currently producing large amounts of waste to go waste neutral and get to zero waste uh, extremely quickly is an approach which is being taken across more and more fields. It started obviously with respect to carbon, but it is spreading across more and more fields today. How do you think about that from where you're sitting uh, in terms of the projects that you're advising on and assisting with? Yeah, I think realistically, uh, you know, you are going to damage the environment when you are urbanizing. Unfortunately, uh, we've seen that in Africa where, you know, if you want to urbanize the population, you will damage the environment and sometimes at quite, quite big costs. Uh, what we're trying to do is we realize you know, humans need uh, to build some level of prosperity, some level of, uh, you know, uh, better t uh, economic development. But how do we actually uh, urbanize in a more sustainable way? It's, it's the key. And how we do it is basically like I explained before, which is a better way of master planning, uh, usage of better materials, uh, use, better use of data, and so forth. And then once you build something, then you can actually run it uh, in a more efficient way. Uh, now we've seen examples of AI managing cities, uh, man managing of traffic, which reduces uh, tra you know, traffic congestion by more than 20% and stuff like that. So we, we are realistic here. We, we, know, we, we have obviously a vision of creating a better world, a more sustainable world, and we will achieve that, hopefully. Humanity will achieve that. But uh, we, we are in the process of urbanizing and the whole, you know, populations in India, in Africa especially, is uh, urbanizing very fast. And unfortunately, we will see a lot of damage to the environment in the next, you know, a decade or two at least. Uh, what we're trying to do is just, you know, do it in, a, in, in the best possible way. Uh, and the least, uh, you know, the, as little environmental impact as possible. But with practicality, obviously. Well, that's a marvelous segue um, back to, uh, to Ingrid, um, because, I mean, let, let's put the urbanization figures in perspective. Between now and 2050, mm. current UN population projection suggest that the increase in urban populations will be greater than 2.5 billion people. Yeah. Yeah. That's more or less, it's not quite as much as India and China together, but it's that sort of scale. Mm. 2.5 billion people over the next 30 years, and 90% of that urbanization is going to be That's in fine. Asia and Africa. Yeah. That's five it's times the US, of population, Europe's population. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So now you made the excellent point earlier, Ingrid, that apart from the underlying challenges in respect of the environment, you made the point that as the variety of pathogens that are present within the landscape 
that potentially will find humans as hosts and cause the sort of disruption that we've experienced in respect of COVID-19. As the climate changes, and cities on average are 2.5 degrees warmer than surrounding countrysides, so urbanization drives heating unless we find much more sophisticated means of containing that. As this urbanization happens, the vectors of host movement for pathogens also shift. And one of the consequences of that is that the pathogens move into environments where human populations do not currently have immunity because they haven't experienced them in the past. Have you, have you thought through how we manage that particular challenge? Do you have any ideas that you can share with us? Um, yes, I think, um, you know, um, just uh, sort of taking some pointers from um, the Stockholm um, paradigm that um, you sort of um, guided me towards recently. Um, it was very interesting to hear the authors sort of give a lecture on um, this particular segment and I think um, what governments will need to do is, um, you're quite right, so regional areas of each country are two and a half degrees cooler, um, will be this population growth um, attracting people towards regional areas. Because um, you're quite right, you know, pathogens like high density cities. Um, and here in, in Australia, where I'm living now, for example, I'm 95 kilometres from Melbourne. They've had about 17,000 cases. We've had 55 here in Ballarat, and I'm only 95 kilometres from the major city. Um, you know, as an example, but I think in order to bring people into regional areas, um, governments need to provide services that attract people into the big cities in the first place. Um, so I think it does require um, a lot of um, sort of political, a lot of sort of government um, support and assistance for regional areas to to strengthen what they're already really good at. Um, the thing that you find in regional areas as well is that people are um, a lot of the times employment unemployment rates a lot higher, so people are more willing to work and things like that. So. I think trying to create an attraction to move people out of high density cities and into regional areas where you don't have to be that far away from the main city, but enough, um, you know, to, to sort of have a healthy lifestyle and not put so much strain and stress on the big cities. I think um, I'm a big fan of this sort of moving populations into regional areas. I think it's going to be quite critical. Um, but, yeah, we need to provide those services that attract people to the big cities in the first place. And that, that takes me back to Sunita, because you uh, set the stage very well on two occasions now in the course of this, where you indicated the proper role of government in mobilizing the whole of society behind sensible programs that actually uh, achieve the purposes that I think we all recognize are necessary. I, let me use a, a cliche that I sometimes use um, in and out of government um, in respect of this and see if it resonates with you in any fashion. I will say that in this sense, governments have an obligation to set policies that encourage investors and others to put capital at risk in search of reward. But governments have to do that within a value-driven framework. They have to do it with a sense of purpose. They have to have a clear sense of how they believe the society should evolve and then devise policies that encourage others to put capital at risk in search of reward. Now, that's the challenge today. It's the challenge we've been grappling with throughout the whole of this discussion and it's the underlying challenge that the world faces over the next 30 years or so. What policy approaches make most sense to address the range of challenges from greenhouse gas emissions through transmission of pathogens that are likely to lead to further epidemics and other health risks 
through large-scale urban pollution associated with relatively weak urban planning environments, particularly in those parts of Asia and Africa that do not have deep benches of urban planning and city design experience. And at the same time, meeting the requirements for social cohesion and social capital within the societies for which the politicians themselves are responsible. Now, that's an awful agenda, but for somebody who's been the Deputy Prime Minister of Albania, I'm sure you'll rise to the challenge. So, if, uh, if anyone has the clear, let's say, um, answer to this question, then uh, this person would be, you know, the lucky person in the world, because, yeah, he will have or she will have the, the solution. And then uh, I hope it is a she who will run the world uh, in the future. <laughs> but let me let me let me make a, a point here. We used to be up to let's say in December, January, so January this year, within a let's say rush for economic growth. And the economic growth per se, in the same time, has entailed the deterioration in global uh, in global climate. Uh, condition, which now is threatening in us to, uh, let's say, undermine prosperity. However, now we have uh, a situation in which due to pandemic, the situation of the economic growth is tough. So now we had an opportunity, and I would like to see it as an opportunity, to rethink and to reshape our internal policies in order to do things better. We saw uh, in China in the beginning, but even in uh, Europe, due to economic uh, breakdown and to the block out of the economy, how clear the air was for, I don't know, one or two months. Uh, how good our, let's say, uh, how good we breathe. And breathing, it's a precondition even for COVID, which COVID is ruining our, let's say, uh, completely our um, respiratory system. So this is a nice example to see how much important is the environment, even with the way of how we are living and about the health and prosperity. But what we can do now is exactly to create policies and incentives to, reduc to, redu uh, to make tax reductions, uh, to make direct subsidiaries and direct expenses, not simply in short term, which as already was mentioned here, that the government in every country paid uh, already the unemployment um, salaries, the salaries, social insurance, give a lot of grants uh, for businesses to really, you know, to overcome the expenses. Now we are in a situation that government need to spend more in a um, clever way, not simply putting an um, amount of money like in every country already did in sovereign uh, collateral or guarantees or direct injection of money and grants in the economy or cheap loans very much with a low cost in order to help uh, businesses to invest but for the time being the climate it's very much difficult none of the businesses is thinking for the future they are thinking how to overcome a month how to pay the salaries within a month how to pay the rent and it's quite difficult to push the businesses in order to invest for the coming six months or for the coming or for the coming year. Yes, government needs to make this kind of expenditures. Government needs to put, I don't know, two, three, five, ten percent of the GDP, uh, even more. It depends on the GDP of the country and it depends on the size, how much uh, you can invest. It depends even on the loan and the uh, sufficient or deficit of each country. Uh, in order to invest much more in the economy. But what's important is that if you have, a, let's say, um, an amount of money which you can directly or indirectly inject to the economy to somehow direct when and where are you going to invest. So these incentives need to be created and need to be given directly to the sustainable solution. It's, it's difficult. I'm not saying that it's uh, something uh, easy. Uh, we need to collaborate and to discuss with each other, not simply academia, businesses and politicians, but even politicians in the region and even governments in the European Union, uh, United States, uh, Asia, Euro-Asia, in order to get from each other the best experiences. 
because none of us has experience uh, in this. Uh, we cannot read uh, in any kind of books or papers or research and to find a similar situation. That's why we are sometimes learning by our mistakes and learning between the uh, meantime we are doing and we are acting. What we can do is to act fast and uh, to adapt. When we see that the solution that we are giving is not turning back what we expected, to turn back and to say, okay, I was wrong. And there is nothing bad to say, I was wrong. And then let's try to, to do it better. There is, a, there is a line we're going to have to draw to an end, but uh, the way you ended that impassioned uh, remark reminds me of a very famous line from Cato the Elder, who in Plutarch's lives is reported as making the simple observation that the wise man, he said, that we can put a woman in its place, the wise woman learns more from the fool than fools learn from the wise. So therefore, understanding where you have erred is the underlying premise of wisdom. Let me leave you all with three thoughts, if I may, because I think you've all got a fantastic contribution to make as we grapple with this challenge going forward. The first is we dare not spend something like $15 trillion in fiscal stimulus which has been enabled by central banks printing money at scale and leveraging low interest rates. We dare not use that money to rebuild the broken world that we had. We have to create a world that is fit for purpose in a period when 8 billion people who are urbanizing at scale are pushing up against planetary boundaries on every level and where tensions within and between societies have reached levels of tension which frankly I haven't seen in the last 30 years. So I think we need a model for rebuilding, utilizing money we don't have and raised through debt. We need to try to create an equitable, secure, and sustainable world. And if we use that as a philosophical frame for everything that we undertake, from waste management, through aligning human life within the biosphere, to government policy setting, to dealing with the challenges of urbanization at scale, if we try consciously to design for equity, human security, and sustainability, perhaps we've got a chance of being successful. Thank you very much for all of the wisdom that you shared with us in the course of this 45 minutes. I think you did brilliantly. Uh, I certainly learned a lot, and thank you all very much for it. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.